hey, it's Jordan with status coup. So we already knew that former President Obama was the driving force that got uh, the remaining opponents of Joe Biden in the 2020 Democratic primary to drop out of the race after Biden won the South Carolina primary, basically allowing him to survive and continue on in the primary. All of a sudden, Amy Klobuchar drops out, Pete Buttigieg drops out, and they're all standing on stage in Texas with Beto O'Rourke. Uh, cheerleading for Biden, which the media uh, loved and showed endlessly uh, right before Super Tuesday. But a New York Times piece actually just revealed that essentially Obama urged Bernie Sanders to sell out during the Democratic primary, uh, something that Bernie did not do. Uh, the headline from the New York Times, still feeling the burn by Maureen Dowd, who occasionally has a good piece. This part was really, really uh, illuminating. When Sanders met with Barack Obama at his Georgetown office in 2018 to tell him he was thinking about running for president again, Obama offered this advice. Bernie, you are an Old Testament prophet, a moral voice for our party giving us guidance. Here's the thing, though. Prophets don't get to be king. Kings have to make choices. Prophets don't. Are you willing to make those choices? Hmm. Very biblical. Uh, Robin Haft, uh, that's Ari Robin Haft who uh, wrote a book about Bernie. He's been with Bernie as a top advisor for years. Uh, Robin Haft, whose brother Ralphie worked uh, at the New York Times, writes, quote, Obama continued making the point that to win the Democratic nomination, Bernie would have to widen his appeal and convince the party to back him, which would mean being a different type of politician and a different type of candidate than he wanted to be. Bernie listened to Obama, but it was clear to me he never accepted that premise. He had a fundamental belief that he could lead an uncompromising movement that would also challenge those who ran the Democratic Party while also leading that same institution, one he steadfastly refused to join. The author sums up with a trenchant point. Bernie may never see the promised land, but he did win. Now, to me, this is less about Bernie Sanders and more about Obama and the neoliberal order that has destroyed America, along with radical extremist Republicans for the last 40 years. Now, let's compare and contrast Obama, 2007, 2008. We need a new type of politics. We need a post-partisan America and all that other hoity-toity, grandiose, uh, the oceans will part if you elect me, a new kind of politics. Yet when Bernie went to meet him, which you know, Bernie Sanders did not want to meet him and probably went kicking and screaming uh, by advice from his advisors to go meet the former president uh, before uh, formalizing another run for president. When Bernie met with him, Obama has a completely different line. Once again, you're going to have to be a different type of politician. Uh, you're going to have to uh, widen your appeal and convince the party to back him which would mean being a different type of politician and a different type of candidate than he wanted to be. Well, in unofficial Washington speak, that means, Bernie, you're going to have to be a mainstream Democrat. Sure, you could talk about, you, you could talk about the long-term goal of universal health care, but you got to focus more on broad themes. You got to focus more on the grave threat of Trump. Don't get so in the in the nitty gritty on, on the policies you champion. M more focus on what's at stake if Trump gets reelected. Oh, to be a fly in the wall of that neoliberal discussion. Now, for Bernie's part, obviously he didn't listen. And what happened happened. Uh, the election in 2020 was just as rigged as 2016. Uh, the infamous uh, shadow app uh, catastrophe or scandal. Uh, that I covered on the ground in Iowa during the caucus and many other things that was the DNC and Democratic Party throwing their whole body on the full scale uh, to rig the election for anyone but Bernie Sanders. But essentially, Obama told Bernie, hey, you want to win this time? It's you got a chance. You got to sell out. Yeah, you could throw out uh, you got to you could throw out uh, whatever, uh, you know, grandiose or uh, ambitious uh, long-term goals you have, but you got to do the backroom uh, backslapping. Uh, you got to do the backroom uh, assurances to donors and others that, hey, don't worry about what I'm saying uh, to these big crowds. When I get in there, I know I got to compromise. 
I know I got to compromise my voters. I know I got to compromise my values. That's essentially what Obama was saying without saying it. And Bernie, being in Washington long enough, knew that's what was going on. But if you think that Obama's influence and OK, well, this was before this was years ago and Bernie didn't listen. You know, a lot of people are uh, frustrated with Bernie nowadays, but he clearly didn't listen to Obama then in 2018. Well, I got news for you. Obama's fingerprints are still all over the Democratic Party. And frankly, who might be the next president? Because I'm not I'm not uh, sure Joe Biden's going to run again. And frankly, through media reports and others, I don't really know if the Democratic Party wants him to run again. Uh, why is Obama's fingerprints all over uh, modern day 2022? Well, I give you the latest Washington, D.C., uh, <laughs> Washington Post murmurs, uh, the top 10 Democratic presidential candidates for 2024 ranked. Well, interestingly enough, they do have Biden uh, ranked number one if he runs again. Who's ranked number two? Mayor Pete of South Bend, Indiana, who's now the transportation secretary doing what? Who knows? Here's from the Washington Post. The transportation secretary moves ahead of Vice President Harris, but not with any great conviction on our part. He ran a good campaign in 2020. We'll, re we'll repeat that he was very close to winning the first two contests, or well, at least now they're admitting he didn't win the first uh, contest, and Bernie Sanders did in Iowa, and would enter 2024 with far more heft as a cabinet secretary, which they would juice up and pretend that he has himself built uh, the very few new bridges uh, that are being built by the bipartisan infrastructure deal, which is really just a privatization scheme dressed up as a historic achievement. Mostly, we'd expect a Biden-less race to be one of the most wide-open contests in recent memory. To the extent people don't want Biden or Harris, he's next in line just in terms of sheer plausibility. Previous ranking, number two. So why is Pete next in line just due to sheer plausibility? Did he get that much more experience as transportation secretary? Does uh, his record in South Bend, Indiana, which was basically about... Uh, pouring in millions of dollars to five blocks to gentrify uh, one small part of downtown Indiana, uh, downtown South Bend, Indiana, spend $26 million on adding a light show to uh, the waterfall in downtown while letting uh, black and brown communities in South Bend rot and basically destroying, not basically, directly destroying 1,000 homes in 1,000 days in South Bend, Indiana for removing blight when most of those residents were begging Pete Buttigieg and the city hall to work with them in upgrading their homes uh, before they were torn down. Yeah. I don't really know what this man's shining achievement would be uh, to take on possibly Donald Trump, who right now is beating president Biden in uh, head to head polling or Ron DeSantis, who is again, galvanizing his forces with now trying to ban 50-something math textbooks in Florida for supposedly indoctrinating children with critical race theory. I digress. But what's so interesting about this, most people don't know that Obama started grooming Pete Buttigieg as early as 2011. I reported for Status Quo uh, several years ago. Take a look. Pete Buttigieg's 2011 donors show the Obama establishment was grooming him from the beginning. Here's the piece. Uh, according to Buttigieg's donors records, first obtained by the Center for Public Integrity and the Young Turks, Buttigieg received 16200 from the Feldman Group, run by veteran Democratic Party pollster Diane Feldman during his 2011 mayoral campaign. Feldman had done polling for both Hillary Clinton and President Obama's presidential campaigns, along with polling and consulting for the DNC and gubernatorial and congressional candidates. It's not clear why this name brand D.C. pollster was pouring in such a significant amount of money into a relatively no name mayoral campaign in South Bend, Indiana. Then you go to other members of the Obama era Democratic establishment who supported Buttigieg while Obama was president. Woodrow Myers, Jr., a former Indiana health commissioner who served on Obama's 2012 reelection campaign, donated one thousand five hundred fifteen dollars. Chris Hughes, a Facebook co-founder who left the company to work on Obama's 2008 campaign, donated $1,000. Matt Burgess, a veteran campaign manager who managed several Democratic senatorial campaigns, donated 515 
Jim Crouts, a top Democratic direct mail consultant who worked on Obama's 2008 and 2012 campaigns, and close friend with 2012 Obama campaign manager Jim Messina, donated 500 Colleen Kavanaugh, the wife of Jeffrey Kavanaugh, who ran multiple re-election campaigns for Senator Ted Kennedy and worked on Je John Edwards' 2004 presidential campaign, donated $500. Robert Barber, Obama fundraiser turned controversial ambassador to Iceland, donated $250. Other donors, Becca Sharp, Obama's 2008 campaign, Christopher Kirk Kirchhoff, former senior advisor to President Obama, counselor John Podesta, uh, Chris Souter, producer of, can of candidate Obama's first television ad. The list goes on and on. Now, you tell me, how did all these Obama people know who was mayor, who was Pete Buttigieg? He was literally a nobody in Indiana. He was running for mayor. He lost the race for state treasurer. Why big time polling firms, uh, big time senior advisors to the president, Obama, uh, big time uh, Democratic Party operatives? Why did they care so much about a little old race in South Bend, Indiana? Well, they seemingly got their marching orders from somebody, right? And Obama, we know, has been fond of Pete Buttigieg, thinking of Pete as uh, basically a uh, uh, younger uh, Obama in terms of breaking the mold and intellect and those McKinsey uh, skills that Pete acquired uh, working at the blood-sucking consultancy, consultancy firm McKinsey. And as we close the loop, remember, this is from the New York Times, when Obama started making calls to basically get people to drop out after Biden won uh, the South Carolina primary and getting uh, Amy Klobuchar, Pete Buttigieg to drop out, Obama, uh, Mr. Obama did not directly encourage uh, Mr. Sandler, Mr. Sanders' rivals to endorse Mr. Biden ahead of the decisive Super Tuesday primaries. But he did tell Pete Buttigieg, a moderate, that he would never have more leverage than on the day that he was quitting the race. And the former South Bend mayor soon joined the avalanche of former candidates backing Mr. Biden. So what does that mean from Obama to Pete Buttigieg? You would never have more leverage, meaning you do what you, you do what we need you to do right now, Pete. We got you when Joe steps aside. That's what that means. And we're already seeing it. Trust me. The Democratic Party uh, apparatus in Washington and the Washington Post, the New York Times, Politico, and that whole Beltway media uh, cesspool, they're one and the same. Most of the stories you start seeing, the midterms, uh, presidential uh, primaries, and of course, the general election, a lot of that inside baseball stuff is directly fed to them from the Democratic Party and, of course, the Republican Party, too, on the other side. So the fact that you have the Washington Post ranking Pete Buttigieg number two, the fact that you have the Washington Post during the bipartisan infrastructure thing inflating Pete Buttigieg's role in it when he had very little to do with it. Uh, the fact that the Washington Post, uh, New York Times, uh, Vanity Fair, others uh, really, really don't miss a chance to do a, va a Vanity Puff piece on Pete Buttigieg. Um, yeah, those marching orders are coming from somewhere. And when I say marching orders, it's understood this is our guy. This is who's going to be on the other side of that bridge uh, Biden talked about to the younger generation. Well, for those of you that need a reminder on uh, Pete Buttigieg and uh, what he, uh, what you get if he is indeed uh, the chosen one, here's some of my reporting uh, from South Bend, Indiana during the Democratic primary. Status quo actually went there, and instead of doing puff pieces on him, we actually showed in real life what his main accomplishment was as mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Take a look at his historic bulldozing of a thousand homes in a thousand days. Wow, looks like a forest in the city. Just empty lots. So right there you got beautiful museum and rebuilt castles. And right behind it you have fallen apart empty lots, forests in the city. This is all under Buddha Judge. And the streets, although we, you know, you're not experiencing them with us, I can tell you they're not even. <laughs> Look at this. This looks like a war zone.
close down businesses, close down junkyards, empty lots. This lot here has been empty for seven years. Homes used to be there, but Buddha Judge, uh, his crowning achievement, he claims, when he came into office was 1,000 homes in 1,000 days. Demolition crews came through here right in the beginning of his administration and just bulldozed all the homes there. And this lot over here to the left, these were all homes, vacant homes, um, homes uh, that a lot of, most of them were not in use, but the black people I've spoken in town to, the working people I've spoken in town to, this was for most of them the only generational wealth they had. It was passed down to them from their grandparents, from their parents. And because they're poor, they didn't have the money to upkeep, pay electricity, fix the roof. You know, they didn't have the income because of their status, being poor or being black or being brown. And Buddha Judge just decided, let's get rid of all of them. So there you have it. A guy who left a sea of vacant lots in South Bend, Indiana, predominantly in black and brown uh, communities, and then spent over $20 million to add lights to the downtown waterfall and mostly focused on four or five blocks in downtown, i.e. gentrification, i.e. economic terrorism. Uh, that's the guy who's the chosen one uh, to take out Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis or whatever other Trump mini me they throw out there. Not only would he be destroyed, but the Democratic Party would then be in the driver's seat. Uh, what is their second preferred position to essentially be the resistance against Trump or DeSantis and hoard money from the resistance flock who follow them and will pour in money to try and take back the House, take back the Senate and take back the White House from very, very granted dangerous uh, Republicans. This is the circle of political corruption, which apparently started with Obama telling Bernie to sell out and then continued with Obama clearing the deck uh, for Joe. And essentially, from what it seems to be right now, uh, media who is still in very, very loyal servitude to the Obama-led Democratic Party, because he's still very influential, see Biden having him speak in the White House a couple of weeks ago about the success of Obamacare, uh, taking their marching orders from the Obama era Democratic Party. Thanks for watching. And remember, join our text list to make sure you get a text message when we're live Monday through Friday at five o'clock Eastern. That's statuscoup.com slash text. And also support our on the ground reporting and investigative reporting by becoming a status coup member for five to ten dollars a month. Statuscoup.com slash join. Thanks for watching and make sure to tune in to Status Coup's daily live stream Monday through Thursday at five o'clock Eastern time and Fridays at four o'clock Eastern time.